Welcome back to Kona. I don't think there's anything more I can do at the general store or the Lachance's house over there. At the moment, I still need the key to this back here, and I still need the material to fix the generator over there if I want to fill up my truck with gas. So, I'm thinking the best thing to do now is go to the doctor's place. Looks like it's not all that far away, and... I've already seen the doctor mentioned a few times in the notes and stuff that we've gathered, so story-wise, I think that's important to go there. And hopefully we'll find some of the supplies we need. So let's go. Nope, not my meat. Not my camera. There we go. Yeah, it seems like there's sort of a, a hidden stamina system. I can only run for a little bit. How are we doing? Alright, about a third of the way there. This bridge is terrifying. This barely looks safe to walk across, let alone drive across. I think I can put away my pistol. I don't think I'm going to be attacked on the road. How are we doing on heat? Oh, not bad. Only down like 20%. Which is the clinic's key. I mean, that's good, but I was hoping it was the key to the building back at the general's door. Medical emergency in town. The doctor there is sick. I'll be back soon. If he dies, I won't be returning. I'll have to replace him. So, you can like, I guess see if there's a key hidden under there. Is there a light switch around here? Does this... This place must have power, right? Does it not? I don't see any lights. Or anything. Ew. Anything that takes power. Wow, a clinic without power. Huh. Isabella. So Isabella was, I assume, the doctor's 
wife, probably. You know, at first I assumed that the photo of Isabella that was in the car was related to Hamilton. I mean, it probably is related to Hamilton, but I thought, like, maybe Hamilton had written the message on the back of it, kind of fawning over Isabella in a really weird way, mentioning purity. But it was in the driver, like, it was in the glove box of the car that was driven by the person who murdered Hamilton. It's, so it's probably not actually Hamilton's picture or writing. It's probably the driver's. For the one-eyed, or for other vision problems, the eye patch was the way to go. Yes, that is that is what an eye patch is for. Attach wire. Hmm. A wired magnet. What am I gonna do with the wired magnet? <laughs> I don't understand. I'm crafting these things with no purpose. Carl got the trembles as he imagined the excruciating pain that kind of scalpel could no doubt inflict. Within these miserable walls, patients probably felt more like in a slaughterhouse than in a doctor's office. Doctors apparently fascinated by history. Earth doesn't look this big from here. So we're in a cool, dry place with a constant temperature, they said. A chamber pot, fortunately for Carl. Inspecting it wouldn't further this particular investigation. A chamber pot. Yes. Fortunately for Carl, inspecting it wouldn't further this particular investigation. Communist Manifesto. The history of all hitherto existing societies, the history of class struggles. Freeman and slave. Patrician and plebeian. Lord and serf. Guild master and journeyman. In a word, oppressor and oppressed, stood in constant opposition to one another, carried on in uninterrupted, now hidden, now open fight, a fight that each time ended either in a revolutionary reconstitution of society at large or in the common ruin of the contending classes. In the earlier epochs of history, we find almost everywhere a complicated arrangement of society into various orders, a manifold degradation of social rank. In ancient Rome, we have patricians, knights, plebeians, slaves. In the Middle Ages, feudal lords, vassals, guild masters, journeymen, apprentices, serfs. In almost all of these classes, again, subordinate gradations. You know, this is giving me, like, feelings of the Red Scare, or Red Scares. I guess there's multiple of them. Because, not just finding the Communist Manifesto, also involving the Secret Service and like, just some of the other notes that we've seen makes me think that there might be some sort of Red Scare thing going on. The Red Scare, in case you don't know, is, well, basically the completely irrational fear of communists like infiltrating and taking over society and, and government. I don't know all that much about the history of communism, but I just peeked at Wikipedia and it says the second Red Scare, which was I guess the the biggest or the, the latest one to be significant, ended in the 50s and this is set in 1970. So that was a bit before this. And I also especially don't know how widespread fear of communism was outside of the US. I know it was definitely big in the United States, but this is in Canada. So I don't know how much it spread to here, how much it spread over the world, I'm not sure. But I'm definitely getting feelings of Oh my god, the communists are coming. Sort of thing. I looked in here, right? Dr. Bopade had done his medical studies quite far from here. He was surely one of the first students out of the new campus to settle on the mountainside. 
Doctors used light-reflecting frontal mirrors to look inside the patient's cavities. That was a bit unsettling, but back then, it was pretty much always the case with medicine. Unknown woman. I never did quite catch her name. The men called her... Lore? Lore? She had a neck wound. There was so much blood, the bullet had done a lot of damage, probably hitting the cerebellum. It was hopeless. She had a cardiac arrest. The men had found her like this, they said. I doubt it. But in a small town like this, it's usually best to turn a blind eye. I've been told to step back from sending out the death certificate. This whole thing sickens me. Oh, this is probably referring to... Um... The... The accident, the tragedy. Remember, um... Giel's? I think it was... Or, no, it was the, uh... Not Giel's, Giel's Lachance was the person who ran the store. The general store. But, um... Remember Giel's Lachance was trying to blackmail Hamilton? And then remember... Their wife, I forgot their name. Um, Giselle? Yeah. And Giselle said something in the last entry in their diary about, like, I feel guilty what happened to this poor woman. Although it was an accident. This is probably that woman, the accident. No medical explanations whatsoever can explain why old Rosier is still alive. As we in the trade say, the only way to cure him is to kill him. Oh, these are different medical files, I just realized. <laughs> yeah. I thought maybe I was looking at, like, the back of the previous document. No, this is a totally different person. All of her symptoms point to the same root cause. She's pregnant. She refuses it. She denies it. I'm willing to bet her husband is not the father. Let's just hope it's not Everett Lockhart, though, or she would have had an illegitimate child and a syphilis on her hands. There was no doubt that the doctor and Hamilton knew each other very well. Hottie, can't be cured, chronic foot pain, can't walk long distances, rich. I'll cure him of that one day. Yeah, let's go ahead and take a look at that diary, actually. Yeah, Giselle's diary. I'm shaking as I'm writing this. I cannot believe I've taken part in this tragedy. I haven't done anything. Why do I feel so guilty? Poor girl. She was so young. Yeah, probably who they were referring to in that first medical file. The good doctor flanked by his beautiful spouse. Pure happiness, captured on cardstock. Carl recognized this woman's soulful eyes. Was it Dr. Beaupre who had hit him head on at the village border? Nobody kills a rich patient to start a revolution. It didn't make any sense. He had to dig deeper still to understand. Luckily, that was Carl Faubert's specialty. Potatoes, and an onion and a carrot. Unlocking a door isn't enough. Hmm? What is that? Is that like a weird offset people? Usually they're in the center. I already opened all these, right? Yeah. Alright, I think that's it for the inside of this place, other than the locked door, of course. I feel like there must be more, though, because this is not going to give me enough to do anything new, you know? Oh, I haven't looked at this. Someone had lost a few liters of blood here. Carl's first thought had been a lumber accident. Someone's hand cut by a saw. Or a hunting accident. 
In any case, whoever had lost all this blood couldn't have gone far. Perhaps they were already dead. Dang, I can't get to the doctor's bag, but there's a lot of nice tools in there. Maybe we'll find like a blood trail outside. Let's look around back. Ooh. That's one of the things I need to uh, fix the generator. Duct tape and pliers. Please use the other door. Oh, it just leads outside. Alright, yeah, I guess that's it for this place. Um, hmm. Where do I head now? Oh. It marked uh, Rosaire's place. It's weird how these places keep getting, like, magically marked. Like, I just... As soon as I encounter them in a document, I somehow know where they live, or something? I don't know how that works, but I'll take it. Alright, back to the road and to Rosaire's place. in the fence. What a broken branches and stuff. Hmm. Ah, uh, well, I'm not really inclined to just go traipsing off into the forest right now. It's broken there too. Could just be general wear and tear. Oh, looks like they've got a fire going in there. I see smoke coming out of the chimney. I just realized I don't have gloves, apparently. I thought I had gloves on, holy crap. Your fingers must be freaking frozen. Yeah, we're doing pretty good on heat, actually. So this looks off to the lake. Can't really see it, though. Alright, first alive person I've seen, Jesus. Can we talk? Can you put that down, please? Je m'attendais pas à ce qu'un étrange retentisse par ici. 
m'a de dire. Je prends plus de chance depuis que ça rôde dans ce bout-là. J'ai ma carabine au bout du doigt, et puis bang, 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 si ça s'approche. <rire> si tu veux du lin chaud, parce que t'es habillé comme un gars de la ville, je dirais pas non à une bonne bouteille de caribou. Puis tu pigeras ce que tu voudras parmi mes guenilles. <rire> Could caribou for coat. Caribou. That's not the fine wine that I took from the general store, is it? No, I don't have it. So we can upgrade our clothes. That'd be nice. C'est vrai, le jeune, que tu te promènes quasiment en bobette. Une bonne police, ça te fera pas de tort. Mais je vais te dire une chose. Dans ton coin de pays comme Paris, on n'a rien sans rien. Et où, mon caribou? Well, I hope you don't mind if I just kind of like loot your place. Encore beau. Tout ce qui est vieilli est bien meilleur. <rire> Vois-tu le livre là C'est le Wendigo. Ouais, le Wendigo. Un guerrier qui devient un loup pour se venger de sa grosse peine. Et... The Wendigo. I wonder if that's the beast then. That we heard talked about. And they said, when they shot, they said they've seen that thing walking around, that's why they were on edge. Talking about the Wendigo, I think. There was a time when hate waged war. Our hunters could decimate the great wolves who had taken our children. Our warriors could snap the necks of the cowards who had reached for our supplies. The well, deafening sound of... The deafening sound of rock and bone breaking was enough to satiate the hate, and the rivers of blood would express our remorse and apologies. Thus was balance maintained. Then came the Whites. The legend of the Wendigo dates back to a time before what anyone but the tallest trees can remember, a time of great cold and great aspirations, when the ships came and spewed men and their fire cannons, plagues and spinelessness. Balance broke forever. The dead were piling up on our ancestral lands. Too many bodies covered in moss. Too much blood spilled on our stone. Our bone-breaking hate did not suffice any longer. One day, a young warrior who had lost everything, nieces, brothers, parents, and hope, fell to his knees in the middle of a small clearing, covered in the blood of his fiancée, killed after having crossed the path of some whites passing by. He had seen everything, and called out to the great spirit, called out to him with words that came so naturally to him, words that could only create a great river of blood and guts, and a terrifying roar of screams. He called out to him for a force that no one had no one had, had before. He became a Wendigo. The Whites were decimated under the icy claws of the Wendigo. The great tide of blood even pushed a few ships back out to sea. But the Wendigo was not yet done with his vengeance. For as long as the heart of one of his fiancée's murderers still beat on Cree territory, he would prevail. The elders say that it was the force of the ancestors returned to nature that turned the young warrior. In this clearing, where many ancestors had been buried in centuries past, a clearing now covered in blood spilled unjustly in a time where too many bodies were being buried, the ancestors heard the cries of the young warrior. Only in a remarkable time like this could the Wendigo have been born. His vengeance satiated the warrior became Windigo, went to rest forever. His frozen heart melted and disappeared, much like real snow come the spring. The storm that had befallen the Cree lands faded as well. There was much celebration. Balance had been restored, but the Whites came back too. White hatred is never satisfied by rock and bone turned to dust. They arrived by the hundreds, armed with guns and torches, burned down every village, raped every woman, smashed the head of every newborn, tortured every man who fell into their grips. Never before had unbalance been so deep for the Cree peoples, and ever since, it has been told that one should be satisfied with the rivers of blood brought by hatred, despite the wrongfulness done to them, because remarkable hate comes at far too steep a price. The Wendigo was never invoked again. But in the hearts of the Cree people remained a fear that one day a young warrior would once again call out with remarkable hate. Because they know, through the wisdom brought by this legend, that the Wendigo would prevail. 
but that this victory would come at a great cost. The Whites would come back. The Whites would rule. None would be spared. Gomme la belle rose la tulipe, qui se donne au yob sur le mercredi des cendres. Si tu peux effrayer cette histoire là. Ash Wednesday. I don't know what that is. Ah, so Ash Wednesday is a it's like a, a Christian day of prayer and repentance and fasting. And it falls on the first day of Lent. Oh la belle pétarade. En 17 que c'était. Et le Kaiser, il se souvient moi avec ma belle carabine. Bang bang que je lui dis. Bang bang bang. Oh, le bon temps. Oh. Thought maybe it'd be a bag full of money or something. What I really need right now is pliers. You know, you really can put that weapon down. I wish they didn't close behind me, because then it's hard to tell what I've looked at and what I haven't. Okay, I guess that's it for this place. So I guess I'll come back here when I find some caribou to trade for a good coat. Where do I go next? Oh, wait, 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 there's a key there. They're acting so strangely. <laughs> Which is kind of like fair enough because I'm acting so strangely. I just went around their entire place. While they're holding a gun and just sitting down in their chair and I just looked at everything. Opened every drawer and just took their keys without even asking. Maybe there'll be pliers in here? I hope. I mean, it's a tool shed. There's probably going to be some pliers. A lantern? Can I... Like, can I just take that out and use it as a light source? Uh, it would have to be equipment. Yeah. Huh. Is there any reason to, though? Like, over the flashlight? Does the flashlight eventually run out of batteries or something? Oh, so you fill up a gas can and I guess fill up your truck or, or whatever without actually having to be at a gas station. That's handy. Exciting. An axe. Not too shabby. Carl felt he needed to protect himself. Hmm. <laughs> that sound. <laughs> In the dark, it's recommended to use a flashlight or lantern. Well, no kidding. Does it like hurt my mental state if I don't? It sounds like I'm punching meat. It doesn't sound like axe on wood. Oh, it looks like drinking a bottle of water improves my mental state. Damn, I just drank a lot of water. <laughs> And I guess I could just fill them up again inside. I get the empty bottles back, of course. Yeah, so entire tool shed, and there is no pliers. Makes me wonder if I maybe just like miss them back at the general store. It's definitely possible.
Yeah, because there's no other place marked. Wait a minute. No, Bedard's place is marked. Who's Bedard? I don't even remember who that is. Okay, well, I've regrouped back at the general store. So I think this is a pretty good place to end the episode. I hope you've enjoyed so far, and when I return, I'm going to go to Bedard's house.